Welcome to Let's Face the Facts. I'm David Almeida, and I'm your host for this rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. I'm an actor in Orlando, Florida, and every week I bring you some of the greatest talent in the Central Florida arts community. Join us as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show, episode by episode. Welcome back again. Happy Wednesday. It's another show, another week. Thank you so much for downloading and pressing play. My guest this week is a super talented, super brainiac, super nerd, Arnie Ellis. He is out in Los Angeles, but a former Orlando actor. He is He's like a renaissance man. He is an actor, a writer, a director, an improviser, and a pretty successful stand-up comic as well. I first met him when we were both working at Disney, even though he's a little younger than I am. He was an old pro, and he was such a great help at showing me the ropes. So I will always uh, hold such a fond place in my heart for Arnie. And I'm really happy that I had him on this week because, ladies and gentlemen, you are going to hear uh, things you have never heard before on this show. You are going to hear me singing the praises of an episode from Season 5. Yes, that's right. This episode I loved. It is my favorite episode of the season, and I think it's one of my favorites all time in the entire series. Yeah, that uh, remains to be seen till we get through the whole thing, but this is right up there. This is definitely top 10, very possibly top 5. So um, why don't we just start getting to it? Why don't we, huh? Arnie and I watched Season 5, Episode 22, called All By Herself, And the original air date was March 14th of 1984. And before we start, I want to let you know how passionate Arnie is about doing the podcast. When I presented him a few different days that we could connect over Zoom, I said, oh, we could do it Friday or Saturday or Sunday. He texted back, let's do Sunday. Facts of life is sacred and needs to be celebrated on the Lord's Day. (laughs) Amen, brother. On that note, let's face the facts with Arnie Ellis. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is all the way from the West Coast via Zoom, taking breaths of clean air where he can in between the bursts of smoke and fire. It is Arnie Ellis! (laughs) <laughs> yes, hello. <laughs> Great to have you. Great to see you again. Damn, it's been a yeah, long likewise. time. Yeah, likewise. Yes, we have so much to discuss. We've already been having a little uh, discourse and discussion like we used to <coughs> do back in the day when we yeah. were fortunate enough to work together at, here, here in Orlando. And uh, I'm so happy you're here. And you responded so enthusiastically to doing this show. So is Facts of Life a big deal for you in your life? I wouldn't say so necessarily. I mean, I certainly did watch it. I watched a lot of television, but let's remember that this is, uh, it's an era of television. People had their favorite shows and families certainly had their shows that they would all sit together at the same time of the week and they would all watch together and and, and I mean, and I loved TV. I mean, I was, I'm a kid born in ni- December, I'm going to be 50. So I was born December of 70. So mm-hmm. I got to come up with Chips and Wonder Woman and like certain, even some shows that I only slightly remember, but my, my parents liked, like for instance, Emergency, if you remember oh that. Oh my show. God. I Randolph Mantooth. And, and then when I'm kind of coming of age and Star Wars happens when I'm in first grade, then we have Buck Rogers in the 25th century and we have reruns of Star Trek. And then a show like this, Facts of Life, which really is kind of coming about in my own pre-adolescence into, I mean, it was on for a long time. So, yeah. so it was present for that and other shows like uh, Silver Spoons, mm-hmm. which I remember loving. And these short form 30 minute stories that really are 20, 21 minutes because of commercials mm-hmm. that, that tell you a story very quickly. They teach you a lesson 
and families would sit together and watch and discuss versus now where because of the amount of choice that we have because of Netflix because of all the streaming services it has created smaller conversations Mm. amongst people especially on social media and in culture whereas if you only had three channels and Thursday night at eight o'clock there were really only three major shows going on chances are you had a one in three chance of connecting with somebody on something that everybody was doing on Thursday night versus now uh you have your Cobra Kai people versus your Game of Thrones people versus your, you know what I mean? It's just, it's everything is niche, really. Everything is niche and yeah. everything yeah. is the, the demographics and the grooves are so much narrower. Uh, I've talked about it on this show all the time. Cause I'm, I'm two years older than you are. I just turned 52 and you exactly what you talk about when you went to the water cooler on Tuesday morning, you were talking about what happened on Archie Bunker the night before Mm -hmm. you watched television. Unless, you know, there was a football game on or something else. It might be that. But the fact that when shows were hits back in the day, they were huge. Yes. Everybody. Everyone talked about Sam and Diane. Yes. Everyone wanted to know what was going on with Sam Mm -hmm. and Diane. When were they going to, like, Cheers was huge. But I mean, that is, and this is something else that's interesting to think about, is I think that the focus on a lot of what is done now in that it's long form storytelling. So regardless of whether the show is on one season or if it's on for 10 seasons, the, the, the drive is always a long form idea. So Mm -hmm. character development, over time arcs all that stuff is thought about in that way Mm -hmm. and a show like this facts of life is a it's a perfect example of it's it's just a super short again i was blown away because you know a lot of the things that we we will hear um we'll hear about decreasing attention span Mm-hmm. All right. Like it's something a lot of times people will talk about with youth culture of social media memes, all of these things that communicate an idea in a very quick way. And therefore the attention span is decreased. Mm-hmm. However, here's a great example of this is a television show that, and I was blown away. Why, I was so excited to get to watch the show again, mm-hmm. but it's a super fast story in 21 minutes where so much is left out, so Mm -hmm. much is left out of this story that would get told today if it were a long form story being done where we could really get into the psychology of these characters and all this stuff. And so the fact that we have that form of storytelling available to us makes me question the general complaint of shortening attention spans so people will yeah. have attention span as the day is long for game of thrones or some other series that they can watch on netflix that and they'll get into detail and all that stuff so it makes me wonder it's like we when we were kids we had these sort of rapid short form things and sound bites yeah. and stuff yeah we had music videos and video games people were saying that about our generation exactly and it just hasn't happened like the, the weird complaint of people not being able to follow something because their attention spans i'm just not seeing it because yeah people will watch podcasts like this or listen to some of these other podcasts sometimes are three, four hours and people follow along and they're, they're into these series that have these yeah. long complicated story arcs. And so that was one of the things that struck me watching this episode was like, Whoa, this is super fast. Mm-hmm. It is. So let me actually start getting to uh, some of the nuts and bolts here, if I may. Sure. We have watched season five, episode 22, called All By Herself. The original air date was March 14th of 1984. And the story was written by four people, 
it was a story by four people, Bob Meyer and Bob Young. We've seen other stuff from them on the show before, as well as these other two other writers, Sherry Eichen and Bill Steinkellner. And uh, looking them up, they are in fact actually married. She would eventually go on and start using her married name, Sherry Steinkellner. And the two of them together had previously written for the Jeffersons. They would go on to write and produce future series such as Cheers and Bob, the Bob Newhart uh, post, what was it? The Bob Newhart third sitcom, the one where he's the cartoonist. Yeah, he was a he was a comic book artist, I believe. Is, was it? Okay. And so the teleplay was written just by the two Bobs, Bob Meyer and Bob Young. And according to IMDb, it looks like the Stein Kellners also work on an episode called Teacher Teacher next season on the Facts mm -hmm. of Life. That is the one where Joe works as a substitute teacher at an elementary school. Hence the title, Teacher Teacher. Lovely. Uh, and the director of the episode is not our typical director. Usually we have a gentleman named Asad Kelada, who's done the bulk of the episodes to date, but this is a new one. This lady is named Judy Elterman. Now she has been the associate director for 54 episodes of this show, but this is the only episode that she actually direct directs. You wonder if, if if Assad wow. got sick or called away or had an emergency Maybe or something. Did she go now? Did she go on to direct any other television after the facts of life or not? She she has a few other directing credits, but they're all seemingly one-offs. So you see an episode of Double Trouble, Silver Spoons, What's Happening Now, and and a handful of Punky Brewsters. Ooh. But it but it seems the bulk of her career is a technical coordinator. And mm which is, you know, very different from a director. You know, a technical coordinator is a more nuts and bolts type of a job versus the well, artistic. Well, but also television direction, though, is very technical. True. Especially very, in very this true. era. I mean, it's, you're essentially you're right. a stage manager and a director. I don't know that there's a lot of, maybe there is some room to actually give direction in the sense of a traditional theatrical director where you're trying to get yeah. nuance out of the actor or whatever. But essentially... This is a factory where once again, you're putting out a 21 minute product and you have a certain schedule to do it. So you have it a week. <laughs> your, your television director in this era is really more, they're less of an artist and more of a technician, I think. More of a traffic cop photographer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's right. I, I really hadn't thought of it that way. Um, but as far as uh, Judy Elterman and her technical coordinator career, 48 episodes of Family Matters. Wow. 83 episodes of News Radio and 44 episodes of Spin City. Wow. Yeah, we'll and, see, there you go. She's, and, yeah. Yeah, that's clearly the primary, the bulk of her career was that. And from what I gathered, I did a little bit of Googling because I'm like, is, you know, job titles, particularly in TV and film, are very nebulous in yeah. what they, what the words say versus what they are. But it looks like it is a technical coordinator is literally the person who maintains the technical equipment, gets involved in pre-production to make sure that they have the actual stuff they need to get the shoot done. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Arnie, I always mm -hmm. like to start off my episodes by yes. putting my guests on the spot. And oh, we're starting you. now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're oh, no, no. We've been, we've started, but we're starting the synopsis now. But before okay. I do, before I do the microscopic scene by scene dissection, mm -hmm. uh, what I always like to do is ask my guests if you would please give us a one to two sentence broader synopsis, similar to a listing like you might find in a TV guide. All right. So the elevator pitch is, uh, Cousin Jerry worried about seeming to be incompetent learns the value of accepting help from others. Oh, brilliant, beautiful. That is absolutely spot on. That's great. And I'm just going to preface this by saying, I really like this episode. I really yeah. like the lesson. I like the way it's presented. Uh, everything seems to be intact with the character integrity and all that. And I've been struggling a lot with season five. 
because this is the first season where we're not at the school and they're trying to find, okay, well, Joe and Blair go to college over here. Tootie <laughs> and Natalie live at a boarding school, but they live here too. And they yeah, all work it, in this store. Does, but you know, again, this is the 80s. Who cares? It works. Whatever mm -hmm. it is, it's working. And that's what yeah. matters. You know, it's, it's on after real people and it's holding the audience. <laughs> oh, so we're not oh going to mess with real it. People. My God, I love yeah. it. Yeah. So, um, so let's get, uh, let's get started with this. We start off in Edna's edibles and Joe and Mrs. Garrett are there. They're dealing with getting something out of the attic for a running joke about a milk bottle and something that was delivered to your door. And uh, Joe says, wow, it's been a long time since anyone's been up in that attic. And I'm like, why? You have not lived there for seven months at this point. You should have gone up into that attic before you moved in and bought the building. And anything up in that attic should belong to you. Just saying. <laughs> so then in comes Blair and she has cousin Jerry with her. And they just got back from the Women's Assistance Society. So this is a group that was having some type of a charity event. And uh, Blair is like, this was a triumph for Jerry because somehow by the nature of their being at the meeting, Jerry convinces them to make the beneficiary, the benefactor of this big fundraiser to be the St. Martin School for Handicapped Children which is where we learn Jerry went to school and it was instrumental in helping her to be independent and learn to grow and evolve with her disability, which is cerebral palsy for those who may not remember. Right. Um, or, or as some say, cerebral palsy. Her appearance on this show is in many ways a landmark in television because yeah. no person with a physical disability had ever been featured as a regular character in, you know, as a regular guest anyway, not, uh, you know, a regular cast member. So this was a big deal. And that she, uh, when Norman Lear discovered her, the fact that her comedy was about uh, dealing with her disability head on. I remember as a kid being so uncomfortable with no. what is happening and what am I seeing on my screen? And then finding that I was being put at ease and made to relax and just being like, oh, okay, this is, this is something foreign, but it's just a learning opportunity. So it's, it is huge that she was on this show, which I didn't, didn't know when I was going to get to this, but uh, here we are, Arnie, I'm going to say it now, which then baits the question, why are you and I watching what would be her final appearance on the show, never to return again? Right. From what I understand, and I don't know 100% sure, but from what I remember sort of reading, because I never watched the show Deadwood, but I know she had a character on the show Deadwood. Yes. And so that kind of, there, she has a bit of a resurgence and in interest in her career. And I remember seeing um, an interview years ago where she said that really what it boiled down to was her management. Apparently, she had management at the time that was really, really awful. and. It's funny, this is going to tie into what we were talking about before you officially started, but because of what the way her management was handling her career, she actually had a reputation as being a difficult person to work with. Mm -hmm. And it had absolutely nothing to do with her. Like she loved the show. She wanted to continue being on the show, but apparently her management was awful and apparently she I think something happened where she that management got fired or she somehow got rid of that management. Or I think it went to jail <laughs> was also something oh, really? I heard in an interview. Oh, is that what happened to the old man was a, cro was a crook? I, hmm, it's, Could it's have been, like maybe the old, but then apparently what ended up happening was the new management that she got apparently was a little too demanding about, like she wanted to get back on the show and then I guess the new management was like, you know, whatever this offer is, you can't take it because it's good. You're going to be letting them know that you're willing to accept that and you're worth. So best of intentions for mm -hmm. her and her career. Uh, but the, the result being that she's never on the show again. Yeah. 
Uh, there is an interview on YouTube, a fairly recent interview, where she talks about it, and I'll I'll post it on the webpage for this episode. And cool. the thing she specifically cites is that they came back with an offer for her to do another episode, like an episode in season six, and the management came back to her and said, "You can't say yes to this. You have to tell them no. That's not good enough. You want to be oh. on more. That's an insult." So it's the whole thing of they they probably went back and said you're you're offering her one episode go fuck yourself and you know yeah. she says i myself still to this day do not know specifically what was said and what the sentiment was but even she said she got a feeling years later from running into asad kalada that there was a sense of you should have taken that one episode and huh. part of me is like no the show should have said this woman is a feather in our cap. We are doing something so unique and outside the sitcom box by including her. Because at this point, as you see, she's just a member of the family. She drifts in and drifts out. There's no, oh, here comes Jerry. Gee, I hope her cerebral palsy doesn't mean she spills something again. <laughs> right, it's, right. You know, it's, it's not. Person like... with a finger on the laugh track waiting for the... <laughs> <laughs> But what goes on is that Jerry has con has convinced them to let her school be the one that is that 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 the fundraiser is for, and so they asked Jerry to be the chairman of the planning committee for this fundraiser, and so she smartly asks Blair to be her assistant because we already know Blair from her history of being a super duper white rich girl that she knows how to plan a fucking banquet or a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. So they enlist Mrs. Garrett and the girls to be part of the catering and to serve Cornish hens. And, yes. <laughs> uh, and basically what they do is even before Jerry leaves, Blair already starts to uh, assemble a team. She already is like, you know, Natalie, if we were going to write a letter, that would be something really good for you to do. And Natalie's like, yeah, I could use guilt. In fact, I'll just send him a copy of the last letter I got from my mother. Right. Put him. Ow! Yep. Yes, yes, brilliant. Archetype Jewish mother. They yeah, used right. that many times before. Yep. And then uh, they have Tootie, and then she asks Tootie, maybe she could get a press release to some newspapers. And Tootie's like, oh, yeah, sure, and the radio stations. So as Jerry leaves this scene, she's like, well, clearly I'm leaving this in capable hands. And her last word before she exits is, remember, it's for Jerry's kids. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's muscular dystrophy. How dare you? Right. <laughs> that's the end of scene one, correct? Yes, 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 it is. And uh, so then we go into uh, the next scene in the living room. And we have Blair on the phone with a magazine pouring on the Warner charm and them flattering her about the sound of her voice. We've got mm -hmm. Tootie and Natalie stuffing envelopes. Natalie is folding and stuffing. Tootie is licking jokes about her tongue being dry and paper cuts and all that. Um, there are some little snips from the episode for the syndicated version. Arnie, for the version that you watched that was 22 minutes long, the actual full length episode was 25. And so there are some lines throughout the episode that are cut out. There's not really a big chunk of a scene that's missing. So uh, there are weeks when I will spend 25 minutes explaining the three that are missing. But in this case, this week, I don't really need to get into it other than this is the first time I noticed some lines were missing while Blair was on the phone. But overall, it really doesn't affect the episode. So for those wondering. Um, uh, Mrs. Garrett, one, two, three, that. In comes Mrs. Garrett saying, okay, Tootie and Natalie, time to work. And Blair's like, oh, come on, please, please, I need them a little bit longer. And Mrs. Garrett says, from 1 to 3.30, they're yours. From 3.30 to dinner, they're mine. And then they do their homework. And a great line, Tootie leans into Natalie and says, tonight we go over the wall. Pass it on. <laughs> right, right. I love it. Very fun. Um, and then I'm also, I'm also trying to edit down as I go here. 
And then Blair also even employs Joe, where Joe is just running out. And she's like, oh, will you drop off these letters? Oh, will you go pick us up some stamps? And finally, she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. So Blair has got, it is all hands on deck at Edna's Edibles, where Blair has just swooped into uh, party planning mode, doing what she does best in her element. So then Jerry comes in. And when Jerry comes in, she's like, so how's it going? And Blair's like, oh, well, we've got this done, that done. I've picked a theme for the event. I've already ordered uh, hats and suspenders for the waiters. Uh, I picked the Shrine Auditorium instead of the community center because they have valet parking. And Jerry's like, whoa, what? Jesus, I've only been gone a day. What the fuck? And then Blair was like, well, you said you wanted me to get going on it. And she kind of did. And then she's like, well, you know, we need to send out the letter, don't we? And then Blair says, oh, already took care of it. Already at the post office. And she shows Jerry the letter and Jerry's like, you signed this. Why didn't you let me sign it too? This is our thing. And again, Blair was just like, oh, we just, we wanted to get it moving. And it's, uh, it was just easier in that way. They're mailed out sooner. And um, so Jerry, you can see is a little bit bent out of shape and justifiably so. On one hand, you see that Blair has, and I like this about the episode, um, as far as I think both of them are equally in the wrong. And that's yes. always a wonderful thing to not have there be a hero and a villain, the good one and the bad one. That's what's so great about this episode. I think that's what makes for really great storytelling is that if you have, regardless of who you assign the role of antagonist and protagonist or whatever, if you can have them both be right, mm -hmm. Or then if it's, you can it's empathize. really good. It's yeah. really good. Yeah, or if you can at least empathize. Like, I'm thinking yes. of the, the second uh, Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in the, the reboot movies. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, Caesar is clearly the hero. Koba is clearly the villain. And yet, you're like, I get why Koba is the way he is. I that's, get why he does what he does. That's the best, man. Oh, that's those the best. movies. I get goosebumps. Yeah. Those movies are <laughs> so much better than they ever needed to be, aren't they? Yeah. Oh yeah, my God. Are. So as this is taking, as this conflict is taking shape here, uh, no, we're, we're at a point where you can tell, we're at a point where Jerry's about to say, Blair, you've, you've gone too far. Slow your roll. Include me in this. And she does say, why wouldn't you have checked with me first? But before she even has a chance to, Mrs. Garrett comes in and says, Mrs. Morris is here from the center. And she says, she has a meeting with you, Blair. And Blair's like, oh yeah, that's right. She, and Jerry's like, whoa, whoa, I wasn't even supposed to be here. How are you having a meeting without me? And Blair's like, well, she was in the neighborhood and she called me and I said, yeah, while you're here, just drop on by. So, uh, and then to further magnify this, the woman comes in and she sits down in the left hand seat if you're looking at your yes. tv screen and right. as jerry is approaching the middle seat which would have been sitting next to the woman blair jumps in and sits next to her like basically <laughs> short of uh you know shoulder checks her yes well this is a very subtle thing but it's a detail that i think is really interesting yes. is that if you as the observer or you as the audience are are watching this you are at the end of the table. Mm -hmm. And so that position that Blair takes is actually the head of the table. Mm -hmm. So yes. visually what you see is you see the power position being taken by this character and then Jerry left to take a subordinate position yes. opposite of the other person that is there, which is I found, I was like, wow, that's a real subtle... Yeah. And kind they played cool. it beautifully. They didn't, yeah. on the part of both um, Lisa Welch and Jerry Jewell, they both played it, Blair played it very natural. Jerry didn't overplay. Jerry, mm -hmm. Jerry does, she's had some moments where they've asked her to emote a little too much in earlier episodes. And I think really the evolution of her as an actress, this is a great episode. Jerry gives a yeah. great performance here. She really does. It's, it's very well oh. written, very solid all the way through. Yes. Now, yeah. I, I do need to pause and talk about the woman that plays Mrs. Winifred Morris. Okay. 
speaking of your archetypes, this is your society lady who is on a committee planning a big fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And so she has this wonderfully, just slightly extended way of, <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful idea, Blair. I knew I could count on you. Right, right. And here's the thing. We have seen this actress on the show before, Arnie. Okay. The actress's name is Susan Davis, and she previously played a character named Betty Schuster in an episode called Read No Evil. That was the finale episode of season three, where Eastland was starting to ban books in its library, and Mrs. Garrett and um, Mr. Parker, the headmaster, uh, struggle in the episode to take up the fight. How how front and center do they want to put themselves in a fight to keep these works of literature in the school, but also deal with the parents who are like, uh, we pay to send our kids to this school. You'll take the books out that we tell you to take out. Exactly. Here's the thing though. She, she's like fantastic actress because she has, um, there is a, she's being asked to do two different things mm -hmm. in, in this scene. She's being asked to portray that, representative of society, whatever that means, right? Mm -hmm, but yeah. she also has to play very much an inside energy with Blair, like we're kind of old friends and we, because it, it amplifies Jerry's feeling of being an outsider. Yes. So it's having to accomplish those two things at once, being mm -hmm. sort of a high status representative, but also having this connection to Blair that's happening at the same time because of that. And so it, it is, it's another fantastic performance from her because she's doing multiple things, but it's, it's not over the top at all. Yes. And a nice thing that the writing does is, uh, she does say on her exit line, Blair, you've done a fabulous job. And in such a short amount of time, you are a marvel. And then she turns and says, bye, Jerry, and leaves. They could have gone the, the road of, oh, what if she doesn't even acknowledge that Jerry's there? What if she ignores right. her? What if she's right. ableist? What? <laughs> but it right. was, no, the, you can tell there's no malice behind her towards Jerry. No. It's just she and Blair are cut of the same cloth, doing their thing. And it's taken care of. Great. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm. Wonderfully done. And yes. Uh, yes. So as soon as she is gone, though, this is where Jerry finally it bubbles over. And Blair noticing Jerry acting unhappy. She says, well, this is okay with you, isn't it? And Jerry comes back with, what am I? An oversized poster child? And then Blair says, well, I do have more experience. And Jerry says, and I do have CP. And you don't think I can handle it. Well, guess what? I don't need your services anymore. And as Jerry tries to reason with her, she just erupts with a butt out. And it's clear, no, no, there is no discussion. Jerry has shut this down. Blair is now out. And Jerry's going to take this on herself. So, J so as Blair throws up her hands... She goes upstairs, and that's where we end the act and go to commercial, Arnie. Yes. Very dramistical. Yes. Very dramistical. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we are at our commercial break, what I like to do is take some time and get to know my guests a little bit better. All right. And sounds good. So I would like to talk to you just a sort of quick McDonald's tour of your life and your career and what brought you to where you are today. Let's start at the very beginning. Where were you born? I was born at Fort George Meade Army Hospital, uh, uh, just outside of, in Maryland. Fort Meade is in Maryland, but it's right outside of Washington, D.C. Okay. So uh, being a Navy brat. Na I was just going to say, which armed force brat then do I call Right, you? exactly. So that's like my early childhood but I didn't, I was one of those Navy brats. I never went overseas. The places I lived was, uh, well, I mean, it was when I was six months old, we moved. My mom, uh, my biological father was in Turkey or something like that. And they got divorced or something of that nature. He was assigned somewhere else. And then my mom ended up meeting my dad, Tom Ellis, who adopted my sister and myself. So we have their, that last name. Mm -hmm. And, but he was also in the Navy. So, um, but we all, we lived in, so that was 
that would have been Fort Meade, Maryland. We lived in Portsmouth, Virginia twice. We lived in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, which is in Jacksonville, North Carolina when I was little. We lived in El Paso, Texas. We lived in Orlando, Florida for like a year or two. Mm -hmm. But my hometown I consider is Pensacola, Florida, which is there's a big Navy base there. It's where my mom grew up and it's where I actually lived from half of sixth grade through high school graduation. Ah, that, yeah, that's mm -hmm. where you will so consider So I consider place home, Florida yeah. my home because I, because I went through high school in Florida like that, middle school and high school, but then I also went to Florida State University and then I was in Orlando for 20 years after mm -hmm. college. So Florida and, is what I consider to be my home state, even though I've been a bunch of places. And uh, so did you study theater when you went to school? I did. I did. My first, like I always enjoyed plays even when I was a kid. Unfortunately, I was one of those children that in elementary school, whenever they would do the school presentation or the school play or something of that nature, I was always cast as the narrator. <laughs> <laughs> because they would be all right so we we have all this whimsical fun happening but we need the 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 voice that's going to walk us through that it has to be arnie and i and as as much as that was fine doing that i was always the kid was like why don't i get to be the character like i want to be the fun so when i was in <laughs> my freshman year of high school uh what is going to be my thing and on the morning announcements was the school play will be having auditions after and that's when i knew i went okay that's it that is the <laughs> thing like i oh yes i remember how i wanted to do like i didn't want to be a narrator when i was like this is yes yeah so my freshman year that first play was a play called whose life is it anyway oh yeah honestly it was the defining moment of this is what I'm going to do. Like, I know what it is that I'm going to do. That's cool. So you were bit by the performance bug at a very young age, and then that carried over into high school. But you are, in, in my perception, you are such a, a, this super intellectual being. And I consider you more than an actor because your talents are far reaching in the realms of writing and performance and improv and, and particularly stand up. And mm -hmm. where did the stand up come into the, this narrative of you as an actor? Well, stand up happened for me. Uh, one of the things that I always loved, and there's a lot of things that I've loved in my life, reading and writing being one of them, and also comedy. You know, Saturday night, well, I was a huge Saturday night. I mean, every Saturday oh, yeah. was, for me, especially in this era that we're talking about with Facts of Life in the 80s, oh, yeah. my Saturday nights were always the same. It was whatever sitcoms happened to be on, and then. Saturday Night Live every Saturday mm -hmm. and then Headbangers Ball on MTV <laughs> with, yes. with all of the the great 80s hairband yes. music videos and stuff. And that was my every Saturday night. So um, the way stand, so I, there was always, again, an, an interest there and a fascination there. Um, you remember A&E's evening at the improv oh yeah totally remember like and just watching those and 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 listening to people's acts and just always being fascinated with that and so um one of my first years in orlando so i graduated florida state in the like that would have been like may of 1993 and i immediately came down because there was a, a a girl i was dating at the time that was from a popka so we came down to central florida together and I auditioned for Walt Disney World as an animated performer, as a mm -hmm. costume character, and I had that job. And then I did a show called Subterranean Bliss. You did that and show? Yes, I did. And Where were you um, in that show? I saw I, that with Fuchsia Pochette. Yes. We were and the I improv played, group. I played the mailman. 
in that Shut group. Up, that and was you? Yes, I don't that was remember. Me. I don't remember that yeah. character. One of the actresses in that show, she actually played the villain. It was it was this stand-up comic, lovely character actress named Kim Millwater. Kim Millwater. Yeah. You yes. remember Kim Millwater? I remember her, yes. So <laughs> um, one night, in re- we're in rehearsal, or perf- I don't remember what it was, but she had met, she mentioned that she was a stand-up comic. And she says, oh, my roommate runs an open mic and we have an open mic every week. It's like on Tuesday nights and it's at the Holiday Inn on Lee Road in Winter Park. And it was being run by a guy named Chuck Jones, who was a super funny gay comic. And it, it was because it was one of the Orlando open mics, that's where anyone that was a comic in Orlando went at that time. So oh, okay. I remember going and signing up so jill sharga was there oh, every jill, week yes um you know kim was there every week chuck this it's where i met dean napolitano was there mm-hmm. all the time on um, the guy named uh mike macy who back then went by his name mike naosi who was a mm-hmm. comic there uh greg Hahn, who mm-hmm. went on to be like a like a fairly prominent um a guy named chris edgerly this was like a magical time to show up in the early nineties and get involved with doing stand up and, and meeting all of these people that yeah. many of them continue to have and also be able to do theater. So the mid nineties were the infancy and developmental years of your stand up career. Sure. And you were doing that while you were also performing at the theme parks doing. Yeah. Uh, as They're I say, all connected because to me, oh, yeah. you know, stand up is, as connected to my actor training in mm-hmm. the same way that I feel like my improv training is connected doing SAC. Cause I did, I did SAC in the mid nineties mm-hmm. when, when SAC was on church street around the corner from terror on church street, it was on An orange, wasn't it? Like an orange and church. It was wasn't on it? orange and church. Yeah. So, right there, there. so I believe Terror on Church Street was the storefront that was on that corner, Orange yeah. and Church Street. And then up the street from there was SAC. And mm-hmm. that was where SAC existed when it had its 20th anniversary. And this mm-hmm. was pre-Bohemian Hotel. So after, as you developed as, as a stand-up, as an actor, and improviser, theme park performer, and then Los Angeles came a calling and you and well, your it's interesting how that worked out because what this is this is how it went down michelle and i get together okay mm-hmm. so michelle and i are we're, we're starting to date and we're having a relationship now michelle had had her own journey with florida you know multiple theme like a lot of people and then she had had a really decent run with you know doing like the glades and burn notice and she a couple of movies and all of that kind of stuff and she as a as a actor in that has a real interest in television and film uh, had in some ways kind of exhausted maybe what florida was going to to mm-hmm. offer i don't know if that's the right word but definitely any opportunities that she was going to get beyond that were going to be similar and you and sometimes limited. ask yourself in life <laughs> what's the next thing yeah can i kick this up a notch you know whatever yeah at the same time that that was going on just before she and i kind of got together i had had some interesting events occur in my stand up career one of them being there was a at my alma mater at Florida State University, Craig Ferguson was the invited guest uh, to do the Florida State homecoming powwow thing. And I think initially they wanted Jeff Jones to probably be the opener before Craig Ferguson. But I think Jeff ended up having another gig he was doing give Arnie Ellis a call. And I I guess they had just looked at my stuff online and they were like, Hey, we want you to come do Florida state homecoming, which was like, Oh my God, that that's my alma mater. This is going to be amazing. So I went and I did, it was Leon County civic center. It was like a 10,000 seat. It was sold out arena show opening for Craig Ferguson. And unbeknownst to me, 
Craig Ferguson watched my entire set from off stage. And when I came, I, I did like 20 minutes. It felt like it was three. I come off stage and he was like, you've got to come do my TV show. Cause he was doing late, late show at the time. Yes. I was like, Oh my God, he got my information that led to me, uh, flying out to LA um, to do the Craig Ferguson, show, the late, late show. And, and I said, Hey, Michelle, come with me. Let's check out LA, see what it's like. We stay with friends in Burbank. We kind of look at it and go, this could be something we might want to do and just see what happens. I do the late, late show with Ferguson. Um, it never airs because they change sound stages. My background's not going to match. There's that whole thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same, yeah, I mean, that's a typical. And the thing is that yeah. Hollywood story is so typical where it's like Common, this commonly cool tragic. Yeah. And no one ever knows about it. And, um, but we, we decided that we would move out here. And, um, and so, yeah, so that's what we're doing. We've been here for seven years now mm -hmm. and it's, it's an intensely interesting experience, especially moving to Los Angeles because I was 42 when we moved out here. Mm -hmm. so, Not a hungry and, kid. <laughs> no, Not, uh... no. It's like, like, and I have friends that have been out here since they were 22, 23 years old, like right out of college, and they've had their experience. And it's sometimes funny to think about what would have happened to me if I had come out here at 20. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different experience than I think what a lot of people have, but I've had a lot of amazing, cool little things happen. And it's in a lot of ways, I continue to be very blue collar about my craft mm -hmm. and my art and what I like to do in the way that I've always been. I'm just doing it in LA now. And, yeah. and LA is super interesting because the weather's awesome most of the time. It's like a lovely place to be. You're around a super cool energy of young people in a lot of ways that all have dreams and they're all out here wanting to do it and everything. And so in a lot of ways, it's artistically fulfilling. It's challenging. It's, it's a lot of things and including a huge pain in the ass because <laughs> yeah. Pretty much everything in Los Angeles is a hassle. Sometimes getting three miles down the street is a hassle. Yeah. It's everything's a hassle. That's mm -hmm. the trade-off. Yes. Well, Arnie, I'm so glad to get this chance to talk with you again and that you <laughs> made a time to be on the show. But Arnie, enough yes. about you. Okay. We have to get back to the facts of life. Yes, we do. We have a very, very important lesson that needs to be learned here. Yes, we do. <laughs> so I love this. We need to come back from commercial. And when we come back from commercial, there is a little teeny tiny bit that is cut from the, um, that's cut from the syndicated version. And the only thing of it of note, we do have a moment where there's a somewhat of a face off between Joe and Mrs. Garrett over what the menu is going to be for this fundraiser. And right. there is a close-up of Mrs. Garrett, who just looks at her and says, I am not serving chili at $20 a plate. <laughs> and Joe says, what? You run out of food? You add an extra can of beans. And Mrs. Garrett just glares at her and says, Joe, you are the stingiest teenager I've ever met. <laughs> and Joe says, thank you. <laughs> and I awesome. loved any time Joe was in this role. I wish they had stuck with it more. I wish Joe had gone into management and business and uh, even even law, as last week's show uh, indicated might have been a possibility. I always loved that and enjoyed it. But that that was absolutely working. Okay, so, so at this the point little scene that we didn't uh, see happens, but we get into now chaos. Yes. It's chaos, David. Right. It's, it's exactly, I was just, you, it's, you read yes. my mind. I was just going to say, now is where the comedy starts. And they mm -hmm. do it beautifully. We have got Tootie on the phone. The phone is ringing off the hook with people asking questions about, well, where is this? Where is that with regard to this, this fundraiser? And Tootie's like, I don't know. She didn't leave any word. Well, Jerry's not here. I guess I'll go try to find her notes. I'll be right back. And then uh, in comes uh, a customer who orders some croissants and it's like, oh yeah, we have to take care of the business of the day. Yeah. The oh, she, that's right. I forgot about this character. She comes in, she orders ham and cheese croissants. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And, and it's honestly a great setup for one singular joke that I love. But <laughs> while she's there, while this is all going on, suddenly this oversized statue of a naked man is just wheeled in the front door, just glides in and is plopped center stage. It's probably, uh, what would you say? Is it like eight foot tall? Maybe probably, yeah. eight or nine foot. Uh, but it's, it's a larger than life male statue of a beautiful male physique. He does have a fig leaf covering the naughty bits, mm -hmm. uh, but it's there. But the best part is the statue comes in and plops itself. And then from behind the statue, we see how it got there. This little man, this little balding, slightly overweight, unattractive, average, below average Joe looking guy walks out from behind it. Did you recognize him, Arnie? He felt familiar to me, but I didn't look up who it was. Um... It was Ernie Sabella. Ernie Sabella, best known as the voice of Pumbaa in The Lion King. Oh, that, okay. All right, fantastic. Ton yeah, 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 yeah. of stage work. Ton of yes, stage career. Yes. Best Classic, friends. The way you described him, you're essentially describing the classic character actor. If you think... Yes, yes. Especially from our era, this is the guy. Oh, this is the classic character actor guy. Yes, and he is there because he's like, they were supposed to come and pick up this statue, but they never showed up. And it's like, well, well don't bring it here. He's like, isn't this where, this is the address I got from this Jerry Tyler. And mm -hmm. I think it was Blair that he, he said like, you know, where does this go? And Blair says, nowhere. Right. And so they try to convince him to take it back. And he says, I've had this statue at my house for 10 years. My wife brought it home and I've been staring at it for 10 years. If you were me and you had the chance to get rid of it, wouldn't you? Meaning I've had to compete with this looking the way yeah. I do. And honestly, the girls have no argument for it. They can't say, take it back, because he's absolutely right. And then he just has this magnificent exit line where he just steps back and as he reaches over, he just goes, enjoy, and walks out. He probably has three lines and crushes it's it. He does. Not only does his performance crush, but the writing is fantastic because you get a real amazing sense of what this guy's life is in yeah. three lines. No, the layers and the way he plays yeah, it is great. Beautiful. I mean, he's, he's, he's still to this day a very competent character actor, and now you, you see why. It was, he was that good back then. Yep. Then we have Tootie going back and forth and more of the pandemonium of, well, Jerry doesn't have her notes and why won't Jerry let us help? And Blair is doing a little bit of I told you sewing. Well, she just let me. I have a... And then in comes the florist. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. That's how yes, I'm saying David, that. You, you and I, you know, we both have a term for this. Uh -huh, do we? Do you remember what that term is? He's a confirmed bachelor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We have used that term. Yes, we've definitely used that term before. Um, so here is the thing. This is uh, character actor Kip King. What a great name. Kip King. He has over 102 acting and voice artist credits in an over 50-year career. Uh, one of the big chunks you see is 63 episodes as Taylor Smurf on the original 82 to 89 Smurf series. So oh, he was wow. doing that while this show was taped. Okay. And he comes in and he's clearly uh, playing it just a little bit fey, but not too crazy fey. No, no, no. It's not over the top at all. It has a, it has a, a coloration, if you will. Yes. There's a, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not a caricature. It, the word, he's playing the same level of character energy that everyone else is playing mm -hmm. in the entire episode. Yes, it is marvelously consistent. And um, one almost could say a word that I don't often say on this podcast. It's subtle. <laughs> right, right. Don't do a lot of that on the facts of life. No. But he comes in and he has an arrangement of flowers in his hands. And he says, I'm looking for Jerry Tyler. I have an order of flowers. And they're like, well, Jerry Tyler is coming back. You, you can just leave those here. I'll take them kind of a thing. He's like, okay, great. Bring them on in, boys. And the visual of this team of 
was there like a half a dozen of them? Actually, no. Is it like Here's three? what's interesting about it. If you go back and look at it, it's it's. I think it's two or three people. And what they're doing is, in a very small space, they're bringing in an additional maybe two or three arrangements. And one of the guys that leaves at the beginning and then comes back puts one of the baskets in the crooked arm of the statue yes. and, and they're all reacting to it as if the room is filled with flowers, <laughs> but it's really not. It's, no. it's the television show budget of we bring these handful of things and then we all play it as if it's really an interesting study of how to do that though, because they really uh. are, they're all like committing. So yeah. it's, it's a really fun kind of little, yeah. you know. And if nothing else, even if the shop is not full of flowers, we have these, these tall stand-up things that come to like, yes. you know, chest or face level. So yeah. they, have, they have volume and they have height. And if yeah. nothing else, they're clumped in the middle of the store. They're in the way. Absolutely. And, and they're being reacted to by the characters as if. Yeah, it's a shop full of flowers, which what's it's what makes it beautiful. It's a like I said, it's a really interesting study of how to make something effective in that way. It was cool. Yes. And the joke of we assume that he's carrying this arrangement saying I have some flowers for this Jerry Tyler. And it ends up being this quote unquote room full of flowers. Um, so it's very funny. And finally he says, I don't know who this Jerry Tyler is, but he must like one of you gals a lot. So he's assuming that the order placed by this Jerry person was for one of the girls present working at the store. And one of them <laughs> to correct him about this Jerry Tyler person, she says, he's a she. And his response is, well, that's none of my business now, is it? <laughs> As he swoops on it's out. Isn't it interesting because you have, if you think of comedy as in threes, okay, so we start out with, we start out with a delivery guy that's obviously a little light in the loafers, so to speak. Yeah. And then we have the mistaken, the mistaken idea of the name representing a certain gender. Yeah. And then we punch line it with, um, he is a she and he tags with, well, that's none of my business. There's a <laughs> lot of. That's like, layered. <laughs> for lack of a better term, gay joke there. Yeah. In a that's... very short, like they packed in a lot of. Yeah. That and, was a... and what I love about that is that it also. Um, it's like I laughed when I saw that scene because I love that the conclusion is that's none of my business. Mm -hmm. I love that it was um, an example because you look at what was going on at that time and all of that. Yeah. And to be able to show an example of, okay, we're going to play with something a little bit. Maybe we don't a hundred percent understand. And maybe yeah. we're going to poke fun a little bit at something that we, that is starting to come into the public consciousness in a way that never has before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're going to maybe draw a bit of a caricature. Maybe there is going to be a bit of a stereotype here that probably could be inappropriate. But at the end of the day, the conclusion we're going to make about it is that it's none of our business. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot of storytelling that has to get packed into this yeah. short amount of time. And they make a super sophisticated point in yeah. 45 seconds. Yeah. No, it's, it's kind of revolutionary like this, this in some This episode is, is amazing, man. It is. No, no, it really is. <laughs> because I think of what if this had been Mr. Furley? delivering a whole bunch of flowers to Janet and Chrissy's apartment mm -hmm. and then say, well, you know, well, this Jerry Tyler must certainly like one of you girls. Well, he's a she. And then you'd get the, Ooh, you get the, the big wide eyed, what a she, a woman is, you know, you get <laughs> right. that type of a ridiculous cartoonish gay is crazy <laughs> type of a reaction. So, I yes. mean, total props, super duper, <laughs> extra props for for that joke before we leave our florist i have two more important things i need to point out arnie yes. number one when he walks in he says is this 320 main street i don't believe at any point we have ever heard the address of edna's edibles 
Oh, I don't wow. think that has ever been stated before in these 22 episodes. So I think that's wow. the first time. I don't know if that means anything. I'm filing it in my memory banks that they live at 320 Main Street, Peekskill, New York. And secondly, when I was going through uh, the credits of actor Kip King, who plays the florist, uh, the last word on that is, in addition to his acting career, he is the father of Chris Kattan. Oh, that's fun. From Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. And his name is Kip, Kip King. There have been multiple times Chris Kattan has played characters named Kip. Oh, that's right. When but Carrie Strug... Did... Remember, he was Kippy. Was it Kippy, Carrie Strug's... Carrie Strug's uh, brother. Well, yes, was Kippy. So he's like yes. playing... Oh, that's, that's really... Isn't that... Oh, that's... That's really cool. I knew you'd appreciate that, but I love yeah. stuff like that, yes. Yeah. Um, then before uh, Jerry shows up and things finally start building toward a resolution, we do get the comedy gold of Mrs. Garrett walking out of the kitchen into the new visual pandemonium of yeah. the shop with all of these flowers, and we get a series of, oh my. <laughs> Oh my! And then she sees the statue. Even with the fig leaf, the fact that he is otherwise naked, her, oh my, she takes off her apron and wraps it around his midsection to cover him up. And it, it is a beautiful, character-appropriate, crowd-pleasing laugh on a scale of one to 10, it's a 45. Yeah, there you go. Amazing. So then, um, Tootie is still like, well, I'm trying to get the name of the trucker that J Jerry was supposed to hire to pick up all this shit. Maybe he'll get it here from the store. And finally, Jerry shows up and they're like, oh, thank God. So everybody's like, well, you've been getting calls for this. And we've got, you know, the statues here. And she's like, oh, no, I have to deal with the florist. And Mrs. Garrett is like, how many hens? You haven't given me a final number of how many meals I'm preparing for this thing. And Jerry's right. like, yeah, I'll get that right to you. And so Sherry at one point says, I have everything under control. And Mrs. Garrett says, no, Jerry, you don't. And then uh, here's a moment where I have to pause for my own OCD. The phone rings in the store. So we hear it in the other room because they're in the living room now. Yes. Well, we've had this ongoing question of, is the phone that is at the desk where we saw Blair talking earlier to the newspaper or the magazine, there have been times when that phone has been an extension of the, of the business line. And there have right. been other times when they have been two completely separate independent phone lines. And apparently in this episode, there are two different lines. There you go. It doesn't matter. It's the it, 80s, man. It matters. <laughs> but we get a great, great moment where Tootie and Natalie say, Jerry, Come on, you know, we, you know, this is your, you're in over your head. And uh, one of them says, I don't remember who it is. Uh, one of them says, we are two able bodies willing to serve. Yeah, that's Tootie, I believe. Tootie says Tootie. that. And Jerry immediately fires back. Oh, and I'm not an able body. And they're like, fuck. And Honestly, I didn't think that either. When they said the line, sometimes you see it coming. Sometimes you see the way they word a line that, oh, that's, they set up and constructed this line such that mm -hmm. the response would be this. I did right. not see it coming. So when J Jerry went, I'm not an able body, it was like, oh, fuck. She's, she, you know, we know she's on, got serious chip on her shoulder right now. And you're yes. like, yeah, that, that is how she would react, really and truly. That was an honest reaction. And then the last word is uh, ring, ring from the phone was Mrs. Morris is at the center, Jerry, and she's waiting for you. And Jerry's like, shit, I'm paraphrasing. And she yeah. runs off, says, I tell her I left. I think the line she says is, tell her I left 10 minutes ago. Yeah. And she runs off, having told nobody anything, having take care of nothing. Yeah. So, hasn't said to Mrs. Garrett how many hens. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Garrett's nothing. just going to have to guess. And yep. yeah. So then after that, it's still the living room, but it is later the same day. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. There's a lot that happens that we're going to spend They've, now that we get to the last scene and then learn the lesson of the scene, but a lot yeah. happened. 
Yes, and they, they cover it very well. Yes, they do. We yeah. start with the empty room, and in they come, and the body language tells you <laughs> some shit has gone down. Mm -hmm. And we do get some expositional, I can't believe it. We were 25 meals short. And uh, d there is some, Blair does more, I told her so, and Joe threatening her with violence. I think Joe says, uh, Blair, if I hear any more I told you so's, I'm going to staple your lips to the table. Is yeah, Joe's so line. hot. <laughs> Put that in your spank bank, Arnie. <laughs> so Mrs. Garrett says, I don't know how we stretched those meals. And Duty says, we didn't. Some people got a mound of stuffing and a wing. And uh, Joe says, I'm just mad that we had to promise all of those people a free family size quiche, meaning mm -hmm. that's going to cut into our bottom line. And, um, but they're right. Otherwise, how would it look for their reputation as a caterer? The fundraiser did raise $11,000. Mm -hmm. So then Mrs. Garrett and Tootie and Natalie go off. And then we have just Blair and Joe. And the Blair and Joe dynamic has always been this magnificent frenemy relationship where they're also kind of like girlfriends and spouses where oftentimes they are the only ones that can really call out each other on their shit. Right. No one else can do it. Not even Mrs. Garrett. So <laughs> Joe turns to Blair and says, I blame you for this. And Blair is like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? I was doing a terrific job. This was all going to turn out fine until Jerry fired me. And Joe says, well, you were doing everything. And Blair says, all I did was make a few phone calls and sign some letters and rent the trucks and get the hall and talk to the newspapers. And finally, the dawn comes. This is the moment, as opposed to being caught up in the I told you so's and being mad at Jerry for firing her, this is where Blair realizes she has fucked up. Right. And then Jerry comes in. Perfect moment for that to happen. So Joe leaves figuring, okay, these two have got to hash it out now. So um, Blair, surprisingly, uh, I shouldn't say surprisingly, it's a good thing Blair has had this little epiphany because uh, instead of I told you so, Blair does try to reassure Jerry. And she does mm -hmm. say, well, you know, it, it wasn't that bad. It went fine and it was all, you know, it, was, it all turned out okay. It'll be fine. And Jerry's response is, no, it's not. They're going to say the crippled girl couldn't cut it. And um, Mrs. Garrett happens to have walked in and now we get the wisdom of Mrs. Garrett. And this is where Mrs. Garrett says, they're not going to say that, Jerry. They're going to say the girl with the chip on her shoulder couldn't cut it because she had to prove something. And Jerry says, well, if Blair could do it alone, why couldn't I? And Blair says, I had everybody working for me. I even had Joe working for me. And, and Jerry responds with, well, you didn't have everybody. You didn't have me doing anything. And then, oh, we get a, a moment of real realness here where Jerry yes. says, and this is verbatim, she says, face it, Blair, you can walk faster and you can talk faster and you think that means you can do it better. And Blair, thankfully, doesn't go on the defensive. And she says, maybe you're right. Next time, tell me to back off. And Jerry says, I did. And Mrs. Garrett once again intervenes and says, no, 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 no. You didn't tell her to back off. You told her to go away. You told everyone to go away. And then we have to get our ABC After School special line, Arnie. Every show has to have the ABC After School special. Don't yes. you understand? I'm handicapped. If I don't do it alone, people think I can't do it at all. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the closest thing to something I don't like in this episode. And it could just be the fact that they still throw around the word handicapped still. They right. don't, we haven't moved into the disability times yet. No. So the entire show, it's been handicap, 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 and we right. just have to get used to it. But, um, Mrs. Garrett sort of says, look, it was a job. It was not a personal challenge. You needed help. And you didn't need help because you're handicapped. You needed help because you're human. Right. And Jerry has this lovely, well, I guess being human isn't the worst thing I could be. Right. So she quickly softens and is like, 
Yeah, okay, I guess you're right. Blah, blah, blah. And then we're we're at the end of the episode. We've aired out all the shit. And so, but here's, this is what's so cool about this episode to me, is yes. that you have, this is a show that is practicing what it preaches in the sense that some of the onus about this pretty much most of it the onus of this event being a disaster is on jerry and jerry has to it's not a clear like we have the handicapped character and everyone else is going to make fun of the handicapped character and then realize that they were wrong and so you have this sort of like consistent moral compass of the handicapped character that is always going to be right no matter what yeah here we have a much more sophisticated story where the handicapped character has to realize that they were suffering from hubris and mm-hmm. going oh my god i have to admit my part in this too and I mean, like that's that's huge, right? Huge. Like, and what that achieves is it humanizes her. It does yes. one more thing for taking this person who lives in a state of other, a person that could easily bring discomfort to the viewer, to someone that doesn't understand or is not familiar with a person with a disability, mm-hmm. and to realize that she has shown. A, a common hubris, a thing that does... Yes. What it does is it sets her on par with all of those around her. It levels the playing ground. And in many ways, even though it was partially due to her disability that kind of put her in that ego place, the fact of the matter is that that was a completely common mistake that any and all of us have made and well, will make and think about this though too is that she's having to realize oh my god it's in insisting that everyone is going to treat me and see me as other that i've actually made myself other and then i've got to realize that if i truly want to achieve what it is that i want then i've got to allow all of those other people that i think are going to see me as other actually i have to let them in to help me Mm-hmm. It's it's huge. I mean, like it's there's a lot of layers. Like like to your point, this is a fantastic episode, and mm-hmm. there's a lot of storytelling they have to do in 20 minutes. Yeah, and um, it makes. I mean, yes, does it brush with broad strokes in a lot of ways? Oh. Of course. Yeah. However, they still make some very sophisticated points in mm-hmm. this story. That and are, still make it funny along the way. Yeah, there was still yeah. plenty of humor and laughs and, you know, quips and jokes like they have uh, yeah. often in these shows. And yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, I think this might be one of my all-time favorites uh, of the series. And definitely it's my favorite of the season because season five has been a little rocky, as I've said, as they've been trying to find the... Yeah, this the is show. a really good one. Well, Arnie, I have had such a great time getting so have I. again. This is great. I yeah. knew you would be in your element in with this talking oh, about thanks. pop culture and analysis and the intellectual strain that you bring to everything. Dude, anytime. I you know me, I will talk anyone's ear off about anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Please send my love to your magnificent wife, Michelle Sims. I will. Whom we had enjoyed last week on last week's episode. So please send my love to her. Until next we meet, until the, the whatever the after times are, after all this is done and when yes. traveling can happen, uh, I, I just want to say thank you again. Smooches and goodbye. All right. Goodbye. And there you have it. That was Arnie Ellis. We talked so much more. Oh my goodness. The extras are really long this week. And that's because, fortunately and unfortunately, we enjoy each other's company far too much. So we just got off on all kinds of crazy tangents and long discussions. And uh, if you're interested in hearing more, I highly recommend checking out the extras on the website for this episode. Also on the website, I'll be posting links to Arnie's stand-up 
and his YouTube channel where you can see a lot of his other stuff. I'll also post a link to that Jerry Jewell interview that we discussed. It's really a shame, and I really and truly, I, I'm very, very sad that I enjoyed this episode so much and that it is the last time we have Cousin Jerry on the show. This is really the end of an era, so uh, mourn uh, accordingly, please, my devoted listeners. And I hope you're picking up on I've Got This Wonderful New Obsession. Thank you, Season 5, for giving me the inconsistent telephone situation. That's right. Is it an extension? Is it two lines? Is it three lines? Does the business line share the home line? It's, it's really uh, another delicious thing you're going to get to hear me talk about probably an awful lot from now to the end of the show. But... Moving on. Next week, I'm going to be watching Season 5, Episode 23, called Seems Like Old Times. You can watch for free on Dailymotion.com. I will post a link to the video in the show notes as well as on the website for this page. So that's it. Thank you so much, guys, for listening to the show this week as every week. And remember, the facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was produced, written, hosted, and edited by me, David Almeida. My theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Our website is facethefactspod.com. You have to drop the let's. And that's where you can find extra pictures, video, and audio extras from the digital cutting room floor. Follow the show on social media. We're everywhere under the handle Face the Facts Pod. You can become a patron of the show by going to patreon.com slash face the facts pod. And don't forget, go to your favorite podcatchers and subscribe, rate, and review. Tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts. <laughs>